So I wanted to thank uh, Dr. Davis again for being, uh, allowing me to be a part of this course. I think it's really outstanding so far. And uh, again, like he said, he wanted me to discuss CSF rhinorrhea diagnosis and management in 2019. So I think the part of any diagnostic evaluation for CSF leaks, we still have to start out with a comprehensive history. So usually, <clears throat> I'm sure based on your experience, you've seen this, you know, the patients complain of this unilateral clear nasal discharge that seems to worsen when they valsalva or when they lean forward. I also think when you tease out the history that it's important to ask them if they have some symptoms that are consistent with intracranial hypertension. I think more and more I've seen a lot more spontaneous leaks as opposed to uh, traumatic leaks. And so I think the symptoms of headaches, any visual changes, ask them if they have any vertigo. I think those are an important elements uh, of a good history. Also any hyposmia that could give you some indication that perhaps the cribiform uh, is involved. You also want to tease out a, a history of uh, meningitis, because you'd be surprised how many of these patients have had episodes of that, and they just neglect to tell you about it. Also, any history of blunt trauma, and obviously any prior surgery. All right, so what about the physical exam? So I, I know this is uh, more of a historical uh, type of test, but it can still be useful, especially when you get inpatient consults. Um, so again, usually uh, when they come to see me in the clinic, I have them uh, lean forward, see if they can elicit any clear uh, nasal discharge. And then we used to look for what's known as this halo or double ring sign. So if you drop you know, some of the nasal fluid on this white cloth, typically you see you know, the central stain of blood and then this clear ring, uh, which uh, is the CSF. And I also think it's very important to do a nasal endoscopy. Sometimes you may be able to detect an encephalocele or uh, localize the site of the defect or the actual leak itself. All right, so what about fluid analysis? So historically, we used to do glucose testing. And if we got a level that was over 30 milligrams, that was considered diagnostic for CSF. But this is fallen out of favor somewhat because it's been shown to have reduced sensitivity if there's concurrent presence of nasal mucus. And then we also have something known as beta trace protein, which is largely available in Europe. It does have a very high sensitivity and specificity, but it's been shown to be somewhat inaccurate in patients who've had meningitis and renal insufficiency. So then we come to beta-2 transferrin, which, as Dr. Davis alluded to, is really our gold standard you know, in terms of diagnosis for a CSF leak. Again, it has a high sensitivity and specificity. All you need is about a half cc. You can actually collect it and store it for a few days refrigerated. So, you know, in answer to that uh, situation or that question that he brought up, you know, what if somebody comes in and has you know, intermittent leakage just for a couple of days and then nothing for a few months? What I usually do is I actually put the order in our EMR already and then send them home with a specimen cup. So that way they can collect the nasal fluid at their leisure. And uh, as I mentioned you can actually leave it refrigerated for a few days, so as soon as they get enough of this fluid specimen, then I just have them drop it off at their local lab, and that's worked pretty well for me. So what about imaging? I think uh, we should always get a high resolution CT uh, in these patients. It helps us to localize the uh, site of the defect. So here you can see it in the cribiform and then the lateral recess of the sphenoid. You can also do what's been termed as a CT cisternogram. I actually don't order this test very much, but my neurosurgery colleagues actually like this quite a bit. So it's a combination of a higher resolution CT plus an intrathecal uh, contrast. It's not typically a first line radiographic study, uh, but you can see it can be very useful in localizing multiple defects. So here again, you can see the contrast uh, through the cribiform, and then here in the lateral recess of the uh, sphenoid. And then I also always get a, an MRI, mainly to detect the presence of any encephalocele that might be present, and especially for the spontaneous leaks in patients who have an elevated ICP. Uh, you could see uh, oftentimes this sort of empty cella uh, sign where the uh, increase into cranial pressure compresses the uh, pituitary gland, and so it gives the appearance of an empty cella. And then you can also order an MR cisternogram, just like you can get a CT cisternogram. So again, this is just a MRI plus intrathecal contrast. And again, that helps you to appreciate you know, the presence of any encephalocele that may be herniating through the uh, defect. 
And this is what I probably use the uh, most often is you know, intrathecal fluorescein. And you know, it's, it's not FDA approved, uh, but I think that if you use it in a certain concentration, at least based on the published reports, you're not going to get you know, the seizures and the neurotoxicity that everybody's uh, concerned about. So typically, you use 0.1 cc's of a 10% solution that's diluted in about 10 cc's of CSF. And then you have to make sure to inject it slowly. So I usually do it about one cc per minute over the course of 10 minutes. So ideally, you want to do this preoperatively, but I think when I've been in practice, I end up doing it intraoperatively just because it's, it's not the most comfortable for the patient to have the lumbar drain put in uh, while they're awake. So if you do it intraoperatively, the neurosurgeon comes in, does the lumbar drain, and then you can do the intrathecal uh, fluorescein. And here endoscopically, you can see uh, the uh, fluorescein here, in this case, draining through the posterior wall of the sphenoid. And then I think one of the most valuable uh, tricks that I learned in fellowship you know, over a decade ago was the blue light filter. I think it really helps to enhance visualization of the uh, intrathecal uh, fluorescein and helps you localize the uh, side of the defect. So I still do this uh, routinely for anyone that I suspect you know, that has a CSF leak positive beta 2 transparent. Now, as Dr. Davis has mentioned, there are these instances you know, where patients have leak and the beta-2 transferrin is negative. And then what do you do in that type of situation? And I just, I just won't do it. I, I'm not going to repair um, something where the beta-2 transferrin is negative. I really need to have, I think, that positive test uh, before you know, I proceed to do an endoscopic CSF leak repair. I mean, it would be interesting to see what my other colleagues think, but I know that's still somewhat of a controversial topic. All right, so what about management? So if somebody has an accidental CSF leak, you know, if it's associated with some type of trauma, like a skull-based fracture, about 70 to 85% of these leaks actually resolve spontaneously. So you're not necessarily obligated to go in and explore it and do a CSF leak repair. Oftentimes, you can actually manage these uh, conservatively, you know, with bed rest for a couple of weeks, stool softeners. You may consider adding a diuretic and giving some prophylactic antibiotics to reduce the risk of meningitis. Now, if the leak persists uh, for a couple of days, then you might want to consider adding a lumbar drain. But if it persists beyond a week, at least the general recommendation is to go ahead and proceed with the repair to avoid meningitis. And then for spontaneous leaks, usually I do proceed with a surgical repair because most of the time they're not going to resolve spontaneously. All right, so what about the surgical repair itself? So I think really the first step is to make sure and localize the site of the defect. I really think that's half the battle. And again, we can use our imaging, you know, the intrathecal fluorescein for that. And then you want to make sure and expose the site of the leak, whatever approach is necessary. If there is an encephalocele, you want to make sure reduce that to the uh, skull base. And then as I mentioned yesterday, I think the other critical step, in addition to localizing and verifying where the leak is, is to make sure and prepare the bed for grafting. So you want to strip the mucosa circumferentially around the defect so that you maximize the adherence of your grafting material to the uh, skull base and make sure that the graft will take. So if you have a, a traumatic or an iatrogenic leak, I think typically a single layer free mucosal overlay graft should be sufficient. If it's a spontaneous leak, typically we try to do a multi-layer repair, so an underlay, an intracranial cavity, followed by an overlay. And then for the larger skull-based defects, that's when you transition to your vascularized flap. So currently, we have a plethora of grafting materials that are available to us, both native tissue as well as uh, allografts. In terms of the actual uh, grafting techniques, as I mentioned, uh, in terms of the uh, terminology, the overlay or the onlay graft is, is really a graft that's just placed within the sinonasal cavity. You don't put anything in the intracranial cavity. Whereas if you do an underlay or inlay graft, it's either placed in the epidural space or in the subdural space. And then you can also do what's known as this bath plug technique. Um, this is typically what we do with the fat grafts, where essentially it traverses from the sinonasal cavity all the way up to the uh, subdural space. So what about our outcomes? So it turns out that 
when we do endoscopic CSF leak repair, it's actually quite good. So there was a systematic review that was published in our Academy's journal a few years ago where they looked at 55 studies over 1,700 CSF leaks, and you can see that the primary success rate was 91%, and the secondary success rate was almost 97%. And that was irrespective of the site of the defect, the etiology, and the method of repair. So essentially, you know, if you follow those basic steps, you know, whatever you put up there is probably going to work pretty well. And there's this other evidence-based review that came out in the ARS journal where they tried to compare the efficacy of the different grafting techniques. And again, they, they couldn't find any evidence to show clear benefit of one grafting material over the other. So I really think that it comes down to a surgeon preference. So with that being said, I wanted to go ahead and just show you a few cases, again, to illustrate you know, some of the basic steps and the fundamental principles of endoscopic uh, CSF leak and encephalocele repair. So this first one was an iatrogenic case. He was a 57-year-old male who had a fess in the past for nasal polyps. His past medical history was significant for uh, rheumatoid arthritis. He was going uh, under a revision fess a couple of years ago. And then intra-op, the surgeon noticed that there was some drainage of clear fluid from the uh, ethmoid roof. So I happened to be operating in the room next door, and he asked me to come over and uh, take a look. So initially, it looks like you know, there was some blood that was pulsating along the skull base, so I thought maybe he had just gone into the uh, anterior ethmoidal artery. But when I looked more closely, you could appreciate that there was some clear fluid draining uh, from this uh, defect here that needed to be addressed. So, you know, the first thing I do when you know, I'm asked to consult in a situation like this is to look at the scan. So, you know, if you look closely, it looks like maybe there was a pre-existing defect here in the cribriform or there was some thinning at least of the uh, skull base. So I think it's always hard to tell with these revision cases if there may have been something that was pre-existing or if this was truly an iatrogenic leak at the time of the uh, revision surgery. But either way, I think when we encounter these uh, traumatic leaks, we have to go ahead and repair them at the time of surgery. So usually, like I mentioned yesterday, now I prefer to get a free mucosal graft from the nasal floor mainly because it reduces the uh, donor site morbidity. So you can just use a sickle knife to make longitudinal incisions uh, at the junction of the nasal floor and the septum, and then below the inferior turbinate, make your horizontal cuts with the caudal, and then just elevate it off the uh, nasal floor with a suction freer. And then the next step, as I mentioned, is to prepare the bed for grafting. So you can just circumferentially remove the mucosa around the uh, defect, make sure you obtain adequate hemostasis. And then the next step is to take the time to precisely uh, position the uh, graft so that it completely lies flush against the uh, skull base and covers the defect in its entirety. So you can use a variety of instruments, whether it be seekers. I think um, our otologic instruments are actually very useful in this regard. You also want to make sure to mark the uh, mucosal surface so that you ensure that you're placing it in the uh, correct uh, orientation. And then you just follow that up with your usual uh, tissial gel foam abatine. Um, and then I do still put in either finger glove or a nasopore. So I think in these types of situations, it's best to, if you can, try to repair the uh, CSF leak at the time of the surgery because you know exactly where the uh, defect is. And then usually you can just watch these patients overnight. There's no long-term sequelae. You don't have to put in our lumbar drain or anything. And this particular patient did very well and he had no further issues uh, since that time. Okay, so what about a spontaneous leak? So I actually think these are a little bit more complicated you know, oftentimes I still like to use a lumbar drain, uh, mainly because sometimes there's actually multiple locations that these patients are leaking from. Usually, as I mentioned, I do a multi-layered repair, just sort of as a belt and suspenders. A vascularized flap uh, may be useful. Postoperatively, you may want to consider a lumbar drain, although there's been some controversy lately, and I think there's been a trend to not use lumbar drains as much as we used to. You also want, want to consider giving uh, Diamox uh, postoperatively to address any intracranial hypertension. A VP shunt may also be useful, especially in patients who've had revision repairs. So just to give you an example of that, uh, here is a case of a 65-year-old woman who presented with your typical unilateral rhinorrhea. 
She was already treated uh, for allergic rhinitis, which unfortunately a lot of these patients are treated with uh, initially. She then ended up developing meningitis, uh, was given IV antibiotics, then had her nasal fluid uh, tested. It was positive for uh, beta-2 transferrin. Her past medical history was significant for hypertension, but she had no history of any sinus infections or surgery. But incidentally, uh, she did have a BMI of 30. So here's what her CT scan looked like. You can see it's, it's not particularly impressive. Um, if you look very closely, there may be a dehiscence here in the uh, curviform, and what looks like maybe some opacification that may be consistent with an encephalocele. And unfortunately, she couldn't get an MRI because she had a pacemaker. So for this patient, I did use the uh, lumbar drain with the intrathecal fluorescein to help localize the site of the defect. And, and you can clearly see the uh, fluorescein stained uh, CSF that's draining around the millimeatus and the uh, sphenoethmoidal recess, and how it also drains uh, more posteriorly back uh, towards the uh, nasopharynx. Uh, you can appreciate that here. And then I usually bring out my trusty uh, blue light uh, filter. And now you can visualize, it looks like maybe an encephalocele here along the skull base. And then you can see the fluorescein stain CSF draining uh, posteriorly. So sure enough, when I looked medial to the middle turbinate, I could appreciate this small encephalocele herniating through the uh, cribriform. So you know, the first step when you see an encephalocele is to use a bipolar and make sure to reduce it up to the uh, skull base and then go ahead and prepare your bed uh, for grafting like I did uh, with the last case in any uh, CSF leak repair. And then this particular situation, I decided to go ahead and do an underlay graft. And like I said, it doesn't really matter, I think, what grafting material that you use. In this case, I think I used some septal cartilage, some uh, acellular dermal uh, grafts uh, as an underlay, and then follow that up with a mucosal overlay graft uh, from the uh, nasal floor. And again, you can use various uh, instruments, even your otology instruments, to uh, make sure the graft lies flush against the uh, defect. And then you can follow that up with your tissial gel form or whatever it is uh, you prefer. So now in this particular case, uh, because she had a very high opening pressure, it was, I think it was like 28, um, I did leave the lumbar drain in for a few days and I did actually give her acetazolamide for a couple of uh, months, um, actually because probably almost a year, and she's had no evidence of recurrence uh, in about eight years. All right, so what, what about for like a revision repair? So th this was a 64-year-old woman. Yeah, she had the typical unilateral rhinorrhea. Uh, she was found to have a dehiscence in the posterior wall of the right sphenoid and had a prior repair with a fat graft. Uh, her leak came back a month later. They put in a lumbar drain. She ended up having symptoms consistent with uh, meningitis. So they actually did try to place a VP shunt at the outside hospital, but they had to abort it because she ended up uh, having some pus in the parietal area. So here's what her CT scan looked like. Again, you can appreciate that there is a dehiscence here along the uh, posterior wall of the uh, sphenoid. And then on the MRI, you can see there is some pooling of uh, CSF here, and what looks like an uh, intracranial uh, abscess uh, here in the parietal area where they had aborted the uh, VP shunt. So again, in her case, she actually already had a lumbar drain in when she came in uh, for transfer, so uh, I did just go ahead and do the uh, intrathecal uh, fluorescein. Here was the uh, previous uh, sphenoidotomy that had done, been done with the previous attempted repair. And you can see that there does appear to be some clear fluid that was pulling in the dependent portion of the uh, sphenoid. So I just enlarged the uh, sphenoidotomy and when I look a little bit more closely, you could appreciate that there's definitely dehiscence here in the posterior wall of the sphenoid. And again, the visualization uh, is enhanced uh, with the blue light filter. And uh, you can really appreciate the uh, fluorescein stained uh, CSF. So now in her case, because this was a revision repair and you know she had an active intracranial infection, I thought it would be best to use a vascularized flap. So just went ahead and rotated a nasal septal flap uh, to completely cover the entire posterior wall of the uh, sphenoid and then follow that up with you know, some tissial gel foam and uh, avatine. So now in her case, uh, our neurosurgeons elected actually not to continue to drain or try to attempt to drain that intracranial abscess. They just um, they treated her with uh, long-term IV antibiotics after we consulted ID. And then after that abscess resolved, 
then she did have a VP shunt put in. And she's had no evidence of recurrence after two years. So as you can see with the spontaneous leaks, um, you also have to address the uh, intracranial uh, hypertension. And this last case is just an example of someone who had a, a lateral recess encephalocele. So the surgical approach is a little bit more unique. So again, this was a 57-year-old gentleman with unilateral rhinorrhea who had a history of uh, hydrocephalus and uh, VP shunt, um, as well as a distant history of meningitis. So here's what a CT looked like. And uh, if you look closely, you can appreciate what may be a, a defect here in the lateral recess. Um, the MRI has uh, some fluid there. And you know, interestingly, you know, the radiologist originally read it out as uh, no obvious dehiscence and no evidence of air fluid level suggestive of CSF leak. So I do think many times you know, the onus is on us to read these films on our own and uh, make the diagnosis, because we might not necessarily be familiar with these types of conditions. So for this particular case, uh, because of its location, we have to do uh, what's been termed as a transpterygoid approach, where you essentially take down the posterior wall of the maxillary sinus, go through the pterygopalatine fossa in order to access that the most lateral aspect of the uh, sphenoid. So that's what I ended up doing uh, for this patient. So again, I still went ahead and did the lumbar drain and intrathecal fluorescein, again, to verify the location of the uh, CSF leak. So with this approach, uh, usually I do start off with a megantrostomy or endoscopic myomaxillectomy just to maximize my exposure. And then you can use your uh, suction freer to uh, elevate the rest of the uh, medial mucosal uh, uh, from the uh, maxillary uh, sinus. And this is very similar to our approach for uh, endoscopic sphenopalatine artery ligation, like we showed you in the lab yesterday. Uh, you could see the SPA down here. And then you can just use your rongeurs to take down the uh, crista ethmoidalis, except in this situation, you proceed from a medial to lateral direction and continue to take down you know, the entire posterior wall of the maxillary sinus so that you can expose the uh, contents of the uh, pterygopalatine fossa. I just think it's important to try to be gingerly about this so you don't pass point and prematurely incise the uh, periosteum because then you could get into premature bleeding and encounter the uh, branches of the uh, IMAX. So here I'm just removing the remainder of that posterior wall inferiorly. So now uh, we could see the uh, contents of the pterygopalatine fossa. You can see the fat, the branches of the IMAX. So sometimes, you know, if this is oriented transversely, you can just use a sickle knife to make a horizontal incision through that, but you can see that in this case it was oriented in so many different directions that I just went ahead and used a bipolar to uh, cauterize uh, those branches. And then you can just use a, a suction freer or a curette to uh, gently tease away the soft tissue until you expose the anterior wall of the lateral recess. So now alternatively, at least in the traditional approach, you can just expand your sphenoidotomy from a medial to a lateral direction. It's just that in that situation, you may end up either stretching or uh, cutting the neurovascular bundle. So there's probably gonna be a higher risk of palatal numbness or maybe injury to the vidian nerve. So I, I always make sure to uh, counsel the patients about that. But with this lateral window approach, you just go lateral to that neurovascular bundle, drill through the anterior wall of the uh, lateral recess. And again, you know, when you look initially, sometimes it's very hard to appreciate the uh, side of the defect and where the leak is coming from. So that's where I think the blue light filter is so helpful. Now you can clearly see the fluorescein stained uh, CSF coming from the uh, skull base. And then sure enough, when I palpated uh, superiorly, looks like this entire area was uh, dehiscent. So again, you know, with these types of uh, approaches, you know, once you get the exposure, you verify the location of the leak, then the first step is to make sure and reduce the uh, encephalocele. So you can just use you know, your bipolar uh, to do that and then prepare the bed for grafting. So you want to strip the mucosa circumferentially. In this case, I just stripped it from the entire lateral recess and then placed a free mucosal graft actually to uh, cover the defect and then followed up with some tissue and gel foam. I think you know the challenge with this lateral window approach is that you have a very small working space, and if you just extended it from your sphenoidotomy, but you can just borrow you know, some of the uh, neurosurgical instruments like the rotons. I think it's very useful to get into these really tight uh, spaces. And then after you, you know, end up obliterating the space, 
Then you can check again with the blue light filter, make sure that there's no uh, leakage. And then usually I just place um, some type of allograft to cover the pterygopalatine uh, fossa contents. And he's had no evidence of recurrence in a couple of years uh, since this procedure. So once again, I wanted to encourage all of you to go to Rhino World, where once a decade um, we host this international meeting. It's going to be in Chicago in June. Dr. Davis and Dr. Welch are actually a course director, so I highly encourage you to come. All right, thank you. Thank you.